Now, what did you present that was so compelling? Well, the first thing we showed them was how the cross of Christ works and how the salvation process works. And then we also told them that the Bible was true and, the, and that they could know and understand the evidence for the Bible. Now, how did the other students feel about what you were presenting? We presented the, the evidence not only to our classes, we had a university-wide program for the entire 8,000 students on the university campus. Wow. wow. What was the name of the program? We called it the Origin Series. Okay. What did you present? Can you break that down a little bit? Sure, sure. We gave them the evidence f that the Bible was true. We also had an evolutionary studies program on campus that was teaching our students that the Bible was myth. And I took it as my personal job to demonstrate that that was not true and to challenge the evolutionary studies program to come forward and meet me in public and sign a document that they would engage in a public debate. We offered them $20,000 if they would come forward, sign the document in front, and I had two cashier's checks, $10,000 each, that we were going to offer them on Saturday morning if they showed up. And I really wanted to give the money away. I'd been trying for 30 years without success. <laughs> Wow. And, and what was the response then from the, the school body with all this that was happening? Well, on Saturday morning when we had our program and I had my two cashier's checks there, we waited for somebody from the Evolutionary Studies program to show up and no one did. No one did. Was Mark there also at that yes, time? Yes, yes. Mark was there every year helping me to set up our backbreaking display. Okay. Now, l let me ask you a question with, with all this that's being presented, was there any uh, issues with the administration or anything like that? Oh yes, absolutely. The president of the university, who was a tra trained PhD biologist, took issue with our program and they published in the student newspaper that they wanted our program to be stopped. What happened? Well, we didn't stop. <laughs> I, I wrote a response to that and I said, we believe in academic freedom. If you have the evidence, come forward and demonstrate it. If you want to shut down our program, there's no better way to do that than to come forward, show that this is mythology, show that the facts are wrong, and certainly I'll be so embarrassed, so humiliated, I wouldn't dare to present this again. What better place to do this than academia? You, you presented a challenge. You say, hey, look, prove me wrong. I'm, I'm willing to admit I'm wrong if you can prove it to me. I, I said, come forward with all the science that you've got because I'll be there Saturday morning. Wow. That must have been a remarkable time. Mark, do you remember this experience? Vividly. It, it was, it's, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was, it was a challenging time. We were waiting. I was expecting someone to come forward, but no one came forward. Wow, wow. Now, how did Elise come into the picture from your perspective? Well, Elise came in as Mark's girlfriend, and, uh, you know, uh, she was sweet and cute. You know, she didn't say a whole lot. You know, I didn't really know a great deal about her, but if she was Mark's girlfriend, that was good enough for me, and she was involved with, with our programs, too. I was surprised at how intense she was and the questions that she had and that she wanted answers to them. Wow, wow. So let me ask you this. Uh, if a skeptic, an honest skeptic, was coming to you and say, hey, look, I'm on this investigation for truth. Uh, I want to understand reality, true reality. Where do I start? What would you say to them in the, that few moments that you have with them? I would say that we really, as human beings, we really only have four tools for knowing and understanding what truth is. Okay, formal argument, science, critical thinking, and strong theory. Um, Actually, as human beings, there's another way that we can learn truth, and we call that revelation. And that comes directly from God, but even that has to come through our senses, and we call that science. And you've been presenting this uh, when you were at that school for how many years? Whew, that's, you're going back a ways. We've, <laughs> we've presented, I was there for, for almost 15 years, and we presented that every year. Wow. Every year on campus, so we had, and we took surveys every year, so we know the impact that we had on students. Okay, uh, Mark and Elise, your life has been changed by the way God used this man. Where are you guys at in life right now? Well, right now it's been quite a journey. So I went from going to the State University of New York, uh, studying to be a teacher, got my bachelor's and master's in teaching, and then midway through my grad school. I just felt this, uh, I would say, personally, it was God calling me to the seminary, actually, after a phone call that I had with Major. Sometimes he just calls me randomly. He's like, hey, Mark, I have something to tell you. you just, so he just said, I just see you at seminary, you know. And I was like, you know, this one time that you mentioned it, I do too. So I just, so that's where we are. We're, we're in Michigan and in the seminary. 
Wow, so now you guys are studying for ministry right now. Wow, that's fantastic. This is what mentorship is all about. Fantastic. Well, it's time to go to a break, but in our next segment, we're going to find out more about something Major Coleman has brought with him. This is sitting right here on stage, a full-to-scale replica of Noah's Ark. Can the biblical story be true? We'll find out more in our next segment, so don't go away. Welcome back to Hope at Night. In our earlier segment, we met Mark and Elise, who recently made the transition from not really believing in God to having a firm belief in Him. We also met Major Coleman, the professor they encountered, who had a major impact on their lives. In this segment, we're going to take a closer look at a story from the Bible, one that has challenged people of faith for centuries, and see if it could possibly be true. Now, Major, I've been itching to get to this. What in the world is this in my stage? This is the largest scale model of Noah's Ark in the world. Uh, what's the story behind this thing? Well, I needed a way to show students on a secular campus that the biblical story of creation and Noah's flood was true. And I figured that the best way to do that was to actually build the ark so they could see with their eyes how big it was and that it would easily contain every kind of animal in the world. Professor Coleman, uh, say someone has never ever heard of the story of Noah and the flood. Could you, could you break down for us really quickly, what is that story all about? Well, it was after the world had been in existence for 1656 years and God decided that because of their wickedness and their violence that He was going to destroy the world. And He ordered Noah to build an ark. And as you can see, that ark was four, 540 feet long. On its launch platform, it would have stood 100 feet wide and been 80, 100 feet high and been 80 feet wide. And this is its size compared to modern ob objects that you can see today. The, the entire flood lasted for over ye a year and it covered all the land on the entire planet. Wow. You know, prior to me becoming a believer in the Bible, I had learned even in Hinduism about the story of a worldwide flood and how a family was preserved during that worldwide flood. Now, I heard this story exist in many different cultures. How do we know that the biblical story is the most accurate story? Okay, well, the best way to test that, again, is with science and understand exactly how the flood happened. Um, before Noah's flood, there was a subterranean water chamber 60 miles down beneath the Earth's crust, which is 60 miles of granite. That water was under tremendous pressure and increasing temperature until it reached about a thousand degrees. Once the crust cracked, it burst forth with the power of a trillion billion atomic bombs. Dr. Walter Brown is the one who invented hydroplate theory and he has shown us exactly how the flood happened. What's so amazing is not that all living life was destroyed. What's so amazing is that eight people and the animals inside the ark actually survived and it would take a boat like this for them to survive. So if I'm hearing this correctly, what you do in your presentations and in your course is you take this replica uh, of a story that's found in the book of Genesis and, and you present the reasonableness of this story. Yes, we show that it was actually could work, that it, that it did work. The first boat in the world that was actually built larger than Noah's Ark was probably the most famous ship and that was the Titanic. It was the first boat that was ever built that was larger than Noah's Ark. And that boat sunk. <laughs> yes, and it sunk, but Noah's Ark did not sink. It, it actually survived. And when you can see this, when I say this is the largest authentic model of Noah's Ark, Noah's Ark was not made out of lumber. It was made out of hewn logs and put together with wooden posts. Um, the walls were three feet thick, okay? There's no such thing as a 540 foot long tree today. So you cannot build a full, full size model of Noah's Ark. This is the largest correct to scale model that exists. So uh, I'm sure a lot of skeptics ask you this question and that is this, wait a minute, all the life that exists in our world today, that's all the animals, uh, that's all the, the, the birds, uh, the, the, the land animals, yes. all of that came from Noah's Ark. 
how in the world did God fit all those animals upon this boat? Well, if you if you look at an encyclopedia of life forms, there are eight, there are 90 of genus forms of life that exist now. The average size, so 90, 90 different kinds. If you count those 90 different kinds of animals and you take the largest species in every genus, by the time you get to the middle one, number 45, you're down to the size of a rat. There were 15,000 animals on the ark and the average size, even if you include a brachiosaurus, um, almost 70 feet long, 110,000 pounds, the average size on the animal of an animal on the size of the ark was the size of a rat. So um, Noah could have had 15,000 rat sized animals and cages on the ark. The total volume of the ark was 2.2 2 million cubic feet. Um, 15,000 cages, four cubic feet, would take up about 25% um, about of the space on the ark. So most of it was empty. Wow, wow, that's incredible. Most of it was empty. And so when, when Noah's ark landed in those mountains, uh, what I'm hearing from you is those kinds or those uh, family groups, they went out and they begin to multiply and fill the world. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so after you have, if you have different kinds of animals or genus of animals, that is, um, they can, you can have different species that come from that. So for instance, wolves, coyotes, dinkos, foxes, they are all dogs. Okay. Right. So you would only need one type of dog on the ark that would be four dogs, two males, two females that could produce all those different species and the same things with the other animal.